Well, good morning. Thank you all for having me here. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm the state rep down in what's known as the 18th Worcester District. So that is four towns in southern Worcester County, Webster, Douglas, Sutton, and Oxford. And I'm going into my third term down there. And as Julie had mentioned, I have a, a personal connection to rare disease. And with me, um, that connection is that I'm the son, cousin, and uncle of individuals suffering from hemophilia. And my story, I mean, hemophilia has been with me and my, my family my whole life. When my dad was in his 20s, um, him and some friends were in a terrible car accident coming down Mount Washington. And this was at a period of time where um, blood transfusion and the understanding of viral diseases as transmitted through blood was not what it is today. And being a hemophiliac in a severe car accident, he was hospitalized for a very long period of time and needed significant blood transfusion. And as a result, he was one of a, a whole generation of hemophilia sufferers in the 80s who contracted HIV AIDS through tainted blood supply. And he became, unfortunately, 10 years later, one of the 4,000 or so out of 10,000 uh, hemophilia sufferers, or sufferers in the United States to pass away from HIV AIDS and complications. But I will say, it's not all a sad story now that the heavy stuff is out of the way. The other thing that happened while my dad was at the hospital is he could not resist flirting with his attending nurse, who became his wife and my mom. So that's kind of why I'm here in the first place. So there is a silver lining to it all. And as I mentioned, um, my dad's two sisters were carriers of hemophilia, so their oldest sons are also hemophiliacs. And my sister, as a symptomatic carrier, just about three, four, God, maybe longer, weeks ago, gave birth to twins, and her son is now born with hemophilia as well. And I can tell you firsthand from growing up watching my dad uh, do self-infusions of factor, clotting factor, every single day, and hearing about my cousins doing the same thing, and hearing about the multiple ankle fusions that another cousin had because of many really severe ankle bleeds that he's had. Going through that and then talking to my sister and about the, the care of, uh, plan of care for her son, we've come a tremendously long way, and, and hematologists across the country have a tremendous um, development in how hemophilia is treated. What used to be wait for a, a bleed, wait for a bruise, wait for a cut, and then try to treat it is now uh, a much more holistic approach where you prevent the, the severe and unexpected bleeds that could lead to cat uh, catastroph catastrophic results. So that gives Christopher, my nephew, and, and all those born with hemophilia a much greater chance of living a relatively normal life today. And so for me, uh, sharing that story, uh, my story and my connection with hemophilia, I think it, it's probably pretty similar to the story that many of you have with your respective rare diseases or the, the stakeholders, whether you're caretakers or family members of individuals with rare disease. And I was doing a little bit of research and I found this list that was compiled by Global Genes, that is 7,000 rare diseases or varieties thereof worldwide with 300 million sufferers and exponentially more family members and caregivers. So I think that while rare diseases by its very definition is uncommon, I, I think everyone has someone that they know or that they're related to or that, that they're acquainted with who has a connection to rare disease. And so that brings me to talking about the bill a little bit. And you know, when I was growing up, um, I kind of thought I was alone. You know, nobody could go through what I was going through. Nobody knew that story. Um, but I didn't need to, to go through that alone, and everyone fighting against hemophilia didn't need to go through it alone within that disease or that, that special disorder. We could have come together, and that's what this bill really seeks to do. And so I think that the, the stakeholders, those affected in the caregivers of every one of the 7,000 rare diseases or varieties that exist, have the same fight. They have the same you know, quest to, to educate themselves and have knowledge about the disease, to raise awareness in the medical community and, and the general public, to uh, fight for insurance coverage and treatment from the medical community and, and ultimately race for a cure. So with each one of those 7,000 disease 
trying to fight the same fight, why don't we bring that together? Um, and that's what the bill does. It, it says, let's work together. So as Julie had mentioned, it's a collection of um, stakeholders in the rare disease community, whether it's geneticists, pharmacists, um, individuals with rare disease, caregivers. Um, and it tries to bring them together so that they can share the knowledge and the developments that they've made. And I look at, um, again, look at my story. What if there had been more awareness of viral blood tran transmitted disease in the 80s? What if the stigma around HIV AIDS had been broken down a decade earlier and that had allowed funding and research to, to move forward at a much more accelerated rate? Thousands of lives could have been saved or improved at a much greater clip, much earlier, without waiting for the disaster to strike. And that's what this bill seeks to do, to, to break down those barriers, to make sure that you know, the efforts of Rare New England and the efforts of the New England Hemophilia Association aren't happening in a vacuum, that they're happening together and they're communicating with each other. There's no reason that a development in an uh, autoimmune uh, treatment for HIV AIDS can't be used to treat Hodgkinson's if it's appropriate. Um, and so the other side of it is also to bring resources and funds together. I mean, we all know the great work and the very, very well-deserved uh, work and recognition for organizations like Breast Cancer Awareness and Alzheimer's. But for every one of those organizations that has a great public campaign and public awareness, there's a thousand other rare diseases that are, are fighting the same fight that don't have the public awareness, don't have the recognition, and don't have the ability to go out and raise a hundred million dollars on a, a weekend walk. Um, and so we're trying to bring all of those organizations together so that those resources, every dollar spent on research can be multiplied across different industries, different sectors. And so you must be now thinking, well, why has this not passed already? And what can you do to help? The answer to why it hasn't passed is that this is just one of five or 6,000 bills filed in Massachusetts alone. And while we sit here and say, yeah, this is a common sense piece of legislation, each one of those 5,000 bills has a sponsor and has a stakeholder group that wants to advocate for it that thinks that their bill is a common sense piece of legislation. And most of them are probably pretty good ideas. Some of them are probably dumb, but um, the fact remains you can't pass every bill. And so part of why I'm here to, to talk to you and, and why I appreciate all the work of Rand New England and everyone here is to share your story. Because sharing your individual story, whether it's with your rep, your senator, or friends who may not know, becomes part of a bigger dialogue on coming together as Massachusetts to fight all rare diseases in, in a much larger capacity. And so whether it's you know, reaching out with an email to your state rep or a state senator, asking them to co-sponsor the bill or asking them to talk to um, the Speaker of the House and, and bring this bill to the priority, or if it's a conversation with a friend at the, at the grocery store on Sunday morning picking up your groceries, sharing your story and not shying away from it brings it forward and brings the importance forward. And so that's uh, really very important. And, and as fantastic as organizations like Rare New England and NEHA are, that individual story that you tell is much more powerful to me as a state rep and to my colleagues at, at, in the House than getting a call from an advocacy group. Because we expect the calls from the advocacy groups and, and they're great and we welcome them and, and you know, we, we need that and we rely on that expertise. But when you get a call from a constituent who says, let me tell you my story as a mother, as a son, as a brother, that rings so much louder in our ears and it humanizes the story. So I'd uh, encourage you to reach out, do a little bit of research on the bill and, and talk to people about it and, and share uh, your story and ask for their support because this is an important bill that we need to move forward. So thank you very much. Yeah. Any questions? Um, does the bill have a number or a number? Uh, it does not have a number because it has not filed been filed yet. We will, we'll, as a legislature, we all get sworn into office the first Tuesday, uh, Tuesday or Wednesday in January. Right. And then bills will be filed two or three weeks after that. After that, it'll get a bill number. Um, but right now, its working title is, um, what is it? An act to create a Massachusetts Rare Disease Advisory Council. 
So there, there are ways to go onto the Massachusetts legislature website and search by that. And you'll, you'll be able to see the last, the bill that was filed in the last session, which ultimately um, did not pass. This one has some tweaks and some edits, but you can look at that and, and kind of get an idea of where it's going. So will you clarify the difference between a docket number and a bill number? So when you file a bill, it becomes a docket number. So it'll, it'll read HD1234. From there, it goes to the Rules Committee, and the Rules Committee will look at the bill and say, okay, what is the subject matter of this bill? This bill refers to health care. If they deem it appropriate, they'll move it forward to the Committee on Health Care, and they'll give it a bill number. So it'll be a different number, but it'll be the actual bill number that will be with the bill through its, its life. So it's really confusing because the numbers can change and the committees it's in can change, but um, it's the, the process of vetting it through and making sure it's in the proper committee to, to get consideration. So, okay, I'm a mom from Wellesley. Do I, um, it, is it best if I look up who my personal, you know, state representatives and, and or is it better to say, I like, is there, excuse my lack of knowledge of yep. is there, like, is there a, a body of people who are like, you know, like, it, there's the House Ways and Means Committee yep. you hear about, for instance, in the, in the national level, and they do the finance stuff, and you got to talk to them. Is there like a healthcare group? Yeah, there's. Is it better to talk to, or do I just talk to Alice Kite? So, I would say the first conversation you have is with your local personal state rep or state senate. And with all due respect to everyone from Wellesley, when I get a call from someone from Wellesley, I say, well, my district's Webster, Douglas, Sutton, and Oxford. Those are the individuals I really care about. So let me give you the number for Alice Peich. And, you know, unless you're really persistent, that conversation kind of comes in and out because we've got people calling us from a million different places. So I'd, I'd reach out to your personal rep or, aid, uh, rep or senator first. And then as the process plays out over the, the coming months and the bill becomes uh, one in front of the committee, and it's totally appropriate, and I don't have the, the committee that'll go before now, but it, it'll most likely be healthcare finance, something of that nature. Um, it is absolutely appropriate to call or email the 10 or 12 members of that committee and, and share your story to them as well. And this being a bill before that committee, it'll pique their interest and they'll, they'll uh, care and be very interested. Absolutely. Um, to sponsor this. So um, is there, um, you know, is part of this kind of out, reaching out to genetic counselors and, and kind of educating them about? A hundred percent. And as, as Julie mentioned, you know, she said that in her past as a nurse, she was kind of apolitical and, and sat back. I'd say that's 90% of the people. Maybe more in, in the working world. They just don't have the time to dive into the political sphere and to learn about legislation, but if someone they know or trust reaches out to them and says, hey, this is really important, this is why it's really important, could you take a minute to, to send an email or give a phone call to your rep so that we can move this forward, that may prompt them, and there is absolutely strength in numbers. So whether it's, you know, educators, geneticists, doctors, pharmacists, any group that could play a part in this should be reached out to, and, and th those numbers should be grown so that if they're all reaching out to their reps and senators and you're, we're getting calls from 25 different industries saying, hey, this is a good idea, this is important, that's going to build momentum. Well, the good news is genetic counselors and geneticists are historically not apolitical, so... Um, <laughs> good. Uh, you got a head start. <laughs> more so these days, so um, I'll talk to you later. Okay? Absolutely, yeah. That's great. Well, we can connect on this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what do we do in the meantime while we still are stuck with him? <laughs> Just yeah, perseverance, I guess. I mean, it is an unfortunate case. Not everyone is attentive and, and uh, caring the way that we all think that they should be. Um, fortunately, you've got a state senator as well, so you've, you've got a, 
a yeah. secondary person that you can talk to. But, you know, build a relationship with another state rep. You know, find a, a neighboring state rep in a nearby district or one that may be on the committee and reach out to them and, and maybe build a relationship with them. Um, most of them are just normal people, easy to talk to. Some of them are <laughs> not easy to talk to. So. Yeah. There you go. So you, know, you start there and, and just try and build relationships a, a, any way that you can. So. Yeah. I just want to comment um, how it originated in Connecticut was our state rep was going door to door. It was re election time. And he was going door to door, and I happened to be outside doing yard work. And I shared our story with him. And, you know, he seemed really interested. He left, you know, thank you, nice meeting you. And then a few weeks later, um, he was knocking at my door, wanting to learn more about this, this task force and this bill that Julie was working on in Massachusetts. So I put him in, I connected him with Julie, and um, he proposed the bill. And a few months later, I testified before the committee, as well as uh, many other people, and the bill was, was um, accepted, and we now have a task force in Connecticut. So it was just through, like, what you yeah. were saying making those personal connections, sharing that story. And he was interested, and they meet monthly. I mean, they, <coughs> they're they still working out, figuring out what their role is and um, what to do, but. Yeah, and that's a very, very poignant story. And, and for me, I find that the issues that we care about often find us. It's not necessarily something that a representative comes into office saying, this is gonna be my core issue. I mean, there are those, but, um, Getting involved with the rare disease community, despite my connection, was one of those things that happened by chance as well. I was in the, the legislature and I got an email from a colleague in Cambridge saying, hey, I'm handing out a proclamation for National Hemophilia Awareness Day, you know, looking for co-sponsorship from the whole membership. I reached out to the him and said, hey, I've got a family connection. Do you mind if I join you? And from there, I've developed a fantastic relationship. But um, so many of the other issues, a representative doesn't have to have any personal connection to a rare disease to become involved and to become a, a champion and an advocate, it, as long as they have that chance uh, connection and you pique their interest and share your story. So, thank you. And co that's how co <coughs> Absolutely, yeah. You approach your representative, you can say, hey, this is who's sponsoring it, maybe you want to. And then I also went around to my doctors, as we happen to have doctors, you know, appointments, and said, hey, Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Absolutely. Any other questions? Thoughts? All right. Well, happy to join you all. Thank you. Thank you.